first of all, thanks for inviting me um, to present here. I had to come up with a title and uh, decided to talk a bit about my uh, favorite program at the moment, Serial EM. Um, so I work at Amble. This is kind of what it looks like this time of the year, somewhere up on the hill. Um, what's always important to know is we have a EM core facility, which is part of the, the cell biology and biophysics unit, uh, where there's a Morgani. Uh, we also use it uh, for, um, for negative stain. There's a CM120, unfortunately out of service contract since this year, uh, that we use to uh, screen plastic sections. We wanted a replacement for the CM120, asked for a Joel 1400. They sent a good salesman, and then we got a 2100 plus. Um, which is also used to screen sections, and then there's an F30 on which we do routinely uh, plastic tomography, plastic fantastic. And then there's a Zeiss crossbeam. Uh, we also tried a Tanaeum volume scope, but we sent that one back. But that's the, uh, so that's the CBB unit that runs the EM core facility, and that's basically these people that run it. Uh, they also, it's a service, but it's also a training service where uh, people come to Amble for a few months. We have two guest houses and a hotel. Uh, they learn the techniques and then take them home uh, to apply at their own institution. That's one of the main tasks for Amble facilities. Uh, I, however, don't work for a facility. We explicitly call it a KIWM service platform, which is part of the structural and computational biology unit, uh, where we use a T12 for crude screening, unfortunately still with a side entry cryo holder, so it's a huge training burden. Uh, a Polara with a Falcon 2 and a GIF 2002, which is actually still used by some people for tomography. Uh, we're fighting our way through getting a, a CIOS or Archilos or what's it called uh, working. Um, since last year, we also have an Arctica with a Falcon 3 and uh, we currently run two Krioses. Um, that's run by basically my good colleague Felix and me. It's just two of us. We do one third of guest access, uh, iNext and uh, also started with direct access, so people can just pay for it. You can find this on the Amble website, on the services, CryoEM, microscopy service platform, not a facility. Um, there's a plan. We're currently, uh, as Jürgen Plitzko said for years, digging a hole, um, but a bigger one than in Martinsried. Uh, the idea is that we get a huge building up on here. It's called, and it's then will be called the Emble Imaging Center, where we have space, I didn't say money, where we have space to expand to a total of six Krios, three Arcticas, and three Arculos. Um, what I want to talk about, why uh, Cerulean, why do I like Cerulean, why do we use Cerulean, and that basically goes back a bit to the history of stuff. Uh, we have a T12 that was shipped with uh, Windows XP. It has an ultra scan. Uh, we run it on Cerulean because it didn't come with EPU. It, didn't, it did come with Tomo, uh, but it's XP, so it's a pretty old version. Um, we upgraded it to Windows 7 in the end. It was part of a software test program that I'm, I'm in. On the Polara, uh, when I started at Amble seven years ago, it was still running Windows 2000, so we had to upgrade. Uh, at the time, it was using Serial EM and UCSF Tomo. I upgraded to XP, uh, kind of tried to introduce the FEI uh, software stuff. Then, uh, about one, two years ago, uh, we did a first test going to Windows 7, but uh, in the end, you know, we could not use that anymore because the GIF 2002 wasn't supported anymore that we could only run through Serial EM on a separate PC. Arctica uh, comes with EPU. Um, we've been fighting to get the Falcon 3 completely working with Serial EM. That's still ongoing. It's supposedly to be released in January. We have it working, completely patched, but it was a, it was a, it was a very tough, uh, tough journey with FEI. Uh, our Krios 1, that was actually system number 10. It's been uh, at Amble for nine years. Um, was shipped with XP with a GIF 2002 and an ultra scan and film. And when I started at Amble, it was all Cerulean. So I kind of introduced the FEI stuff because I just came from FEI and thought, you know, this is much better. Let's just, we should be using this FEI stuff. So uh, we did that. Uh, then uh, some money came up. We got a Falcon 2, so we were still doing that. Then some money came up, uh, we got a Quantum K2, we then moved the Falcon to the Polara, and yeah, here in this situation, unfortunately, there wasn't any software to run this thing, so I had to completely move to Serial EM. And, and, um, and since then, I kind of decided, okay, everything is going to be Serial EM because it's a lot easier, you have one user interface that you teach everybody, plus you don't have all these problems with something new comes out, some new detector, you see the same thing with the K3, it's gonna take forever until these companies have it integrated properly, while David Marstonade has something working already. Because uh, 
you know, FEI will only support their cameras, and currently, if you want the latest stuff, you need to have a Windows 7 system anyway. Um, Gatan is kind of the same thing. Like you know, and I have to mention it, but I'm not an IT guy, and I don't want to be running an IT project setting up three servers. Every time I look at it, I try it a couple of times, because if you see it working, it's really nice, but it's just so intimidating to, to get running. So that just was not an option. And Serial EM still runs with Windows 2000, with XP and Windows 7, on all these microscopes, on all these cameras. Uh, there's currently this new thing coming out, it's called FEI Maps for navigation and stuff. That's basically what's been in Serial EM for years. You can do cryocorrelations, all these things in Serial EM. You can upload your cryofluorescence images. And we did that already many years ago. So, um, we kind of stuck with the uh, Serial EM now, because it's just a lot easier to kind of lock everything down. Too many scopes, too many people wanting too many, uh, too many different things. And uh, in the beginning, I mean, Felix, my colleague, started a year ago before that I had to do it all on my own. So uh, I kind of broke it down into, into recipes. And in the end, the only thing we want to do is map grids, maybe do some correlation. For a single particle, you want to screen a little bit, which squares look OK. You want to map those squares. Then you set up the holes, and you run your stuff. Um, this is something we haven't done for a few years, but at the, the time when John Briggs and Tanmay Barat was, uh, did these high HIV tubes, where we did a hybrid 2D, 3D approach, would be the same thing. You map your grids, you map your squares, you set up thermal positions, you just run a different script. Um, normal tomography stuff, same thing, map squares, map grid squares. Maybe you want to do some correlation, set up thermal, run a script. Um, and then recently with Julia Mohammed's group uh, starting, and also have the, the back group, uh, we're doing this uh, on lamella now from the Archelos, if we get lamella from the Archelos, uh, where you might want to do some manual screening, map the lamellae, maybe a correlation, and set up stuff. Those are kind of the recipes. Um, I've locked this down quite hard that way, because in the end, uh, I want to minimize the amount of time that uh, I need to be in the room, if needed, or the users will be in the room. Because in the end, I think it's a data collection tool, not a microscope. So for any session, um, we now basically go into the room, we load a cassette, and then we start a script. And the script will basically wait for an X amount of minutes. On the old autoloader, it's 15 minutes. On the new autoloader, it's five minutes. Then it will map every single, it will do an inventory of the autoloader and map every single grid in the autoloader. And when it's done, you get an email. And that's uh, standard uh, Cyrillium scripting. I'll uh, show later where you can find these scripts. Um, so you go in, you load, you start that script, and then you leave the room. You go have a coffee, check your email, do something. You just wait until the microscope sends you an email that these grip maps are done. And then you go back to the room and check which one looks promising. Or, you know, they call me and said, they're all black. There's something wrong with the microscope. Um, then for a single particle uh, kind of uh, recipe, you would want to screen for good squares, so you need to set up low dose. Um, and then basically, once you find good squares, you set that up, and you want to map those too. So compared to, for instance, the FEI approach, where you take one image in LM mode, we take a montage in the lowest assay mode with a high defocus and an objective aperture and an energy filter, which makes you uh, see certain particles. If they have a certain size, you will see them in those images. If it's really small stuff, you still don't see anything in the holes. But that's kind of the where people have to make a choice, maybe saying, I choose a slightly higher mag, but you know, ribosomes, TMV, uh, those kind of things you can see in those images. And then we make montages of those images. And that we can basically automate again. So we go to each square, we run a eucentric height, take a montage, save it as a map, next square. So that might run for one or two hours. And then you get an email from the uh, microscope. And then you go back in and uh, basically set up your positions. You tune the scope, you tune the GIF, you take a gain ref, all that stuff, and then you run. Um, and it's pretty much the same for Tomo. So I'd like to kind of really lock down these things in certain, in certain distinct steps that we always repeat, because the only thing we do in the end is tomography in single particle. A um, couple of details about Serial EM uh, for the single particle stuff that I uh, really like. So we've calibrated post actions. Post actions means Serial EM knows uh, when the camera will take an image. You know, it has a certain startup time. Serial EM also knows when the shutter closes. So if we take an image, we're not waiting until an image is completely back and returned to Serial EM. Serial EM knows when the shutter is closed and will then already take the next action. 
which speeds things up tremendously. And um, we combine that with early return next shot. An early return next shot means you can let the camera or Cerulean basically return an image earlier than everything else is finished. If you take 20 frames, you can say early return next shot 10. The moment it has the 10 frames, it will return an image. In this case, for single particle, I always set it to zero. I don't want any image to be returned, which basically makes Cerulean just write frames. Um, we do that uncorrected with LZW compression. So there will never be an image returned. There's only raw data being written. It's compressed. Uh, we do 8-bit because when you compress raw data uncorrected, there's no difference between 8 or 4-bit in, in, the, in the compression rate you get in the, the, the final da uh, data size. Um, so during acquisition, we center a hole, we autofocus, we measure drift, and then afterwards you don't see anything when it's actually taking images because it's just writing those to disk. And it saves a ton of time because if you want to display an image in Serial EM, uh, it has to get the frames, they have to be gain corrected, they have to be summed, and if you had a rotation there, they also have to be rotated, and all these things cost time. And that's where you save time, and a lot of time. So, um, but in the end, I want to see something. So what we've did is, because uh, we Siri Liam comes from David Mastronardo, who also writes iMod. So I put a slightly bigger support PC in. FEI doesn't care if you put a different PC in, as long as it's Windows 7 or 10 and their rapid stuff works, they're fine. So slightly bigger PC with one GPU on which we installed iMod. So support PC in Windows 7. You just download iMod, it's free, it just installs itself. And then you have this thing called Frame Watcher, which basically can see the frames that Siri Liam has written on the Catan PC. And then there's a program, iMod Align Frames, which is Motion Core 1, so whole frame alignment, and then I always say with a touch of David Mastronarde, because uh, he basically made it really fast. And um, so we pick up the frames, we align the frames, and then uh, it will output to Emble Network from the support PC, so it's immediately out of my ecosystem because I'm not running a storage service. Um, and it writes the raw data, so the raw frames, a gain ref, an aligned image, and most importantly, a JPEG. This is a, an example of such a JPEG, where David basically makes an image with a power spectra as a JPEG, which is about 700 kilobytes, which ends up on Emble Network. This is what people monitor. People don't remote on the microscope. This is written in some person's Emble folder, and this is what they watch. It's very small, so it's easy to look at from home. And the moment they see a black stripe or anything, they send an email. Or they look at the power spectra and say, that focus range is really not okay, we need to change it. So that's kind of the only monitoring we had so far. Um, we're changing that now with my new, uh, one of my new favorite programs, Warp. Uh, although we basically run it only for CTF at the moment, we'll soon probably also do the particle picking. I'm kind of waiting for the next version that will do the frame alignment and write an output that is compatible with Redarian 3 to later do the polishing. And then uh, we might think about, you know, adding more data, uh, uh, writing more data, and then see how to process. But our users typically want to process everything themselves anyway in their favorite program because the samples are always so bad that they always try five packages before they give up. So, um, but this is, is, this is kind of promising. I just still need to order uh, a couple of nice big boxes that can keep up. So, in the end, I mean, uh, one PC with a slightly bigger GPU, I call this, you know, a poor man's pipeline. But it kind of has done the job for the last years. Then for tomography, I don't know why. Everybody likes to use this dosimetric tilt scheme. Um, I think for a good reason in the end, because there's a lot of uh, stuff happening in a sample during tomography. This is basically uh, between the first and the second branch of a tomogram uh, with only 30, 20 or 30 electrons it was, which gives you a certain X tilt because the tilt axis is actually here, which was very difficult to align. If you do this with a dosimetric scheme, you don't have that problem. Um, so we do all orthoma with a dosimetric. Um, slightly different flow. I put a GPU in the Gatan K2 PC. Um, we run a dosimetric tail scheme. We do on-the-fly alignment, basically, as, we, as the images come in. But uh, the nice thing is David made a new function, David Mastronarde, that with post actions and all these things, I can now basically take a tilt image, and the moment the shutter is closed, it will already tilt to the next tilt, while it is still reading out the camera. Then it has to align the frames, but I don't care because I'm 
it takes a bit to go to the next tilt, and it's always good to wait there a bit until the drift comes down. So I don't care that I lose a bit of time there. And uh, we still save uh, uncompressed, uh, compressed, uncorrected uh, uh, frames, just in case that new algorithm comes out in three years and people want to reprocess their data, which, by the way, never ever happens. But currently, with plus minus 60 degrees and three degree steps, so 41 images, and that's kind of the standard, you know, the Briggs thing, uh, we can do this now in 27 minutes with basically on the fly uh, frame alignment. And uh, everybody seems to be kind of happy with that. So uh, I'll have to see. I'm, I'm invited for this high speed Tomo workshop in New York, but I'm, I don't feel like I'm a big supporter for that. Um, but anyways, with that, you can still uh, use IMOD Frame Watcher and Align Frames, also for tomograms, where you would basically say all the data is just written, you don't do frame alignment, and once the tilt series is finished, it will pull all the data over into your support PC with IMOD, and then do all frame alignments for your tomograms and stuff, and sort your stack and everything, so you get a com completely frame aligned stack, uh, well, raw tilt series out. Um, there might be some that now think, okay, how do you get this data from your uh, GitHub PC to your support PC? Because FEI, unfortunately, pulls a direct line between these two PCs. And then you don't have any direct access. You probably have to go to some other line, probably Kasim is using the team viewer on a GitHub PC on a line that you use for, data, for pulling the data off. You have a very big switch. Yeah, but in the end, uh, so you put a switch in. Okay, because that's uh, not allowed by FEI. Yeah? We are not allowed to put a switch in. I did the same thing. <laughs> but just to make a point, it's not allowed by FEI to put a switch in. But I put a simple switch in. Not every single model works, but this one, the standard blue Netgear ones. Does it actually transfer I've been doing this for uh, three and a half years. I don't see any over the one gig, and I don't use a 10 gig. Because, you know, we use this LZW compressed stuff, so uh, uh, 40 frames is about uh, 200 megabytes. It's not one and a half gigabytes that I have to pull out. And then everything is just fine. The advantage with this is because you can remote in this through VNC, through the standard FEI basically stuff. You can VNC in, into your support PC. Uh, your Cryos PC would be port 5905, and I basically made the GitHub PC 5910. Uh, and then I have remote access to everything. I can pull stuff out of everything. I can automatically, with the support PC, pull stuff out of the GitHub PC. And it's all over one gig. I'd love to do it over 10 gig, because GitHub has 10 gig. Cryos does not, and there's no free slot that that runs a 10 gig card. So a slightly bigger PC, you know, helps. S considering the cost of the instrument, that's not tough to save on. Hmm? So uh, that's kind of how we run. Again, it's a poor man's pipeline. Uh, I plan to put in a slightly bigger uh, support PC with two GPUs and then do a full warp thing. Um, Remote and data transfer, so internal users, uh, their data is written to network by this whole frame uh, watcher thing, uh, which also means that I check, you know, certain users and come in and say, I don't have space. Well, then you're not collecting. If you don't have space, you're not collecting. That's the bare minimum I ask for people to have group space, because uh, otherwise it just doesn't make sense. And I don't want people to come in with external disks, because that would slow the whole pipeline down. Um, for external users, we got a uh, massive 10 terabytes, but... Uh, the fun thing is, it, it lasts for months because our data sets, even if we talk about nine to 10,000 images, are typically two, three, 400 gigabytes. More, it's not more than that, because it's all LZW compressed. And we run a pretty low dose rate. We try to stay under four electrons per pixel per second. And then uh, the data is very, very small, and I don't need all that space. And then it's still very doable to then transfer it over an Emble Aspera server. So once people, once their session is done, we just send them an Aspera link, they download it, Three months later, if our 10 terabytes are full, we kind of look at, okay, who is the oldest one? We send them an email, is everything okay, and then we delete it. So we, nev we don't have really have any infrastructure or professional system uh, in place yet. It might change soon once we have warp running, because then we might be providing more data. Maybe we send particle stacks. We don't know yet. We just have to think about that. Um, training. Um, I do data collection training only. We train people how to collect data on the T12 with Serial EM. So that's where they uh, learn 
how to set up Lodos in Serial EM. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I would love to drop that thing because, it, uh, as Becky said, the side entry stuff is just a nightmare to learn. That's also why nobody's requesting any Polara training anymore. Uh, but the thing is, you get them running on a T12, you then bring them to a Talos Arctica. The only thing you have to teach them is how to clip grids and put them in a cassette. Because the Arctica also runs Serialium, it's exactly the same. It's the same Lodo setup. Uh, even if you would have EPU in a T12, you'd probably be using the user interface Lodos and EPU, and then later maybe Tomo, and uh, I just don't want that. I want everything to be the same, and we see that it really cuts back on, on the amount of training we have to do, because we lock everybody into this serial EM loop. Map your grid, map squares, set up Lodos, do stuff. They learn this on the T12, and it's what they do on the Arctica, and it's what they do on the Krios. Uh, EM training is on request, so they have to ask for it, and then they don't. It only happens basically in the last few months when a group leaves, like the BRICS group, where then suddenly panic strikes and suddenly they need training. But then I said, well, you're going to LMB, you're going to get training there anyway, which I also would do if somebody comes from somewhere else. They, can get all the, they could have all the training they, they, they think. I would have to want to look at it. So, but you, you just see that maybe, say, 10, 20 percent of people that are really interested will pick up and will learn more stuff and kind of you know, get into it. Uh, but in the end, it's all about data collection only. And, uh, and I just want to minimize the, the need for operator help. Um, what I mean with that, because in the end I made a, a kind of a help system, now I have to see if this is going to work. Of course this is not going to work. Can I move this thing? Yeah. No. That's also not what I wanted. Here we go. And then I can do that. Okay, so I kind of also kind of made a help system, which started as some uh, some some text and stuff, and then I put it into a into a web thing. Uh, so this is for all our instruments. So for Krios, for instance, they just would go here. You can read a bit about what to do. I put some numbers in. Uh, distortions we corrected on the microscope. They might want to make some connections on the support PC. What's the microscope status? It kind of got out of hand over the years, I have to say. Uh, foolproof manual to swap a tank. And I had to change these a lot of time, eh? because every time something happens and you think like, really, I have to write that down? Yes, you have to. <laughs> so, um, but in the end then, uh, the thing is, you load. This we teach them. Uh, everybody loads themselves. Internal, I mean. External, that we, we load. But in total, everybody loads themselves. I don't want them to be waiting for me every morning. Um, and then it's a bit, it's, it's a lot, but it's very detailed how to uh, map grids. And then for single particle, how to set up lodos. We want to have on the fly frame alignment when screening. Then we basically set up the mapping of the squares, set up the grid squares. Very important tuning and stuff. So we do a tune GIF every session, which means every three days in the Amble case. Uh, we take a dark graph and all that stuff. Then uh, microscope tuning, and that's really the only thing they touch. We use auto CTF. Still have to change that because Serial EM can do the same thing nowadays. Uh, where I'd say, okay, we want to run a Zemlin Tableau. You put in your objective aperture, you center it, then you run auto stick mate again, and that's it. And that's the only thing we do in the microscope. Nobody else touches any alignments whatsoever. Um, what else do I have? how to set up the on-the-frame alignment, on-the-fly uh, frame alignment. Uh, I also kind of looked at, uh, you know, you might have a black stripe. How do you save yourself out of that one? Uh, there might be a water failure. How do you save out of that one? Restart software. Uh, this happened once where a postdoc called on a Saturday and uh, I decided to make a manual. So if somebody has like a lot of guts, they can try to just restart the whole system, start to you know completely like power down and power back up. It's it's happened once and it was successful. It was quite amazing. But uh, so that's kind of what people use and that's what they follow. And and again, you know, we, I just made this for every system, uh, even even for the spirit. Uh, we kind of kind of make these things. And I made it as foolproof as possible, so people could, you know, most, nine out of ten times when people come to me and say there's a problem, I said, did you read? Because here's the thing, you're doing it for the 20th time, you're not going to read that stuff again, you know what you're doing. Yeah? 
but you can always catch them on, you didn't read. But it's my responsibility to make sure that this is right, that this covers it. And that's kind of where uh, there's a lot of time involved in keeping these things up to date. But uh, that's kind of my uh, that's kind of my help system. Um, no. <coughs> Sorry. So that's what people use. You learn data collection. If you want to learn EM training whatsoever, yes, sure. Uh, another thing that's really important with the training stuff is um, PIs always want training and data collection together. Where I say no, you either train or you collect data. Because I don't want to be training till five o'clock and then spend until nine to set something up for the night. And uh, yeah, it's not a, it's not always easy to explain that to them. Um, so in the end, Serialium for me uh, replaces Maps, EPU, Tomo. It also completely replaces Latitude and Latitude S from uh, from Gatan. It currently has Auto Stigmate and Auto Coma built in. So David did a port of CTF Find 4. Actually found some bugs which made the normal CTF Find 4 uh, even faster. It already has built-in active beam tool compensation. That's a development I was doing with FEI, but apparently David was doing it in parallel with Chen Zhu. It's super flexible. I was able to write a tilt scheme with it. The support is so fast. If David doesn't respond for a day, everybody gets worried. I told his wife recently, so that's why David now also sends emails when he goes on holiday for a week, because otherwise we get worried. Um, it works with everything, but I have to admit, if you start with it, it has a bit of a steep learning curve. Huh? You have to really just invest your time in it and not do what a lot of people do. You try this package on Monday, that didn't work, try that one on Tuesday, and, on, and the one that did it on Thursday is going to be the thing that you stick to for 25 years. You have to put some time into these things. Um, there's nice support, uh, the Serialim script repository, so that's where people upload their scripts, my scripts are on there, is maintained by uh, Gunther Resch at Nexperion, he started his own company. Gunther also offers this as a service, he will install Serialim for you, calibrate it and everything. He's a consultant, costs money, yes. Uh, I still think it's worth it if you don't have the time to kind of dive into it, and he does a fantastic job. If you want to get into Serial EM, they also have a fantastic YouTube channel. You just go to BL3 DEMC, where they have a lot of, of, of nice videos. Uh, I think it's all from, uh, from Cindy. Um, I myself learned a ton of stuff from Chen Zhu, who is now at the uh, University of Massachusetts, uh, on just these special things like uh, early return, next shot, how to speed th stuff up, how to really get every second out of the out of the pipeline to, to speed it up. And um, with that, I can then basically say, uh, for acknowledgement, David Massonade, ultra fast support. You ask something on Saturday evening, you go for a beer Sunday morning, you have a new version with a function. Um, Chen, who's always been very helpful, the whole community, because there's also a complete email list behind it where everybody's helping each other all the time. And uh, my colleague, Felix Weiss. And um, I'll kind of stop here and uh, be happy to take questions. Any questions? So I guess it's about some hardware stuff. It's, I guess who told you that you couldn't have a search? It uh, is, is, uh, I can send you the, the manual where it's written. It's explicitly forbidden by FEI, by your service department. Yeah? Well, they didn't tell me that. <laughs> no, but I mean it causes uh, no, but it causes a ton of problems, eh? and, and 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 just because they don't want to look into it, because it's certain model switches that don't work. Now the Netgear works. You also have a. I found you have two big switches in the Krios, and one of them was unused, so I'm using that one. Yeah. It was completely unused, and I'm using that one, and that works fine too. So you actually, you know, you actually ship one in your instrument. But you explicitly say, you cannot use the switch, which is kind of sad, because it makes stuff a lot easier if you have everything hooked up together. So I haven't actually had that comment. Even, I mean, it comes from your service department. Good. Thank you. Other questions? Everybody's convinced? Or everybody wants a coffee? Yeah, who's convinced? <laughs> Who wants a coffee? Who's actually going to do it? <laughs> <laughs>
Alright, it's not bad. Not bad. All right, uh, thanks again, uh, all the speakers of the session.